Hey, it's Dr. Lori, and I'm back answering your questions uh, from all different places. You send them in from our website and social media and YouTube, wherever, and I'm going to answer the questions. I always put the questions in a bowl, and this week's, this episode's bowl is, of course, American Chino pottery. American Chino pottery, relatively contemporary from the nine, late 1990s into the 2000s, and this is a nice example. This bowl is worth $300. So let's get started. All right, let's see what we got. Hi, Dr. Lori. Can't figure out why this vintage Corning Ware two-quart La Marjolaine, 1960s, 1970s, in used condition piece that's listed on eBay is so expensive. Can you explain? Yeah, I can explain. <laughs> I can explain that. Um, there are others on eBay in the thousands. I just don't get it. Well, let's talk a little bit about this, why you don't get it. Uh, you don't get it probably because you're familiar with this. It's familiar to you, right? Um, people can list anything they want for any amount they want anywhere they want, right? I mean, it can be way, way out of line. I saw one listed at $19,000, and I saw one that sold for $3. So why is the one that you're looking at that you say, wow, it's into the thousands and it's listed so high, this piece of corning ware, why is it listed so high? Why are you taking that as a sales record? Because it's not a sales record, it's a list, it's a price, it's a wish, it's a hope, it's a dream, that's what it is. So basically what you've got there is somebody who has enough guts and gumption to go, I'm gonna put this up for a lot of money and see what everybody does. And a lot of people will follow suit. They'll just come and they'll just list it all high too, hoping that they hit the holy grail. Well, that's not really the way the markets work. What's interesting is the one that's $3, nobody talks about when you get the great, great bargain, and that's really the story. Um, the other thing about this with respect to those folks who are listing things incorrectly on all of these particular sites is they don't really know how to analyze the market. And that's what someone like me knows how to do. People who just follow along aren't analyzing the market. They're saying, oh, well, you sold it for this or you're listing it for this, so I'm going to list it for that. It's not an appraised value till somebody pays the bill, until somebody pays with Apple Pay, pays cash, writes a check, swipes a credit card, whatever, then it is a value. Other than that, it's not worth that. So if you have one of those and you're thinking, hey, maybe I can get $1,000 for mine too, realistically, it's usually not what they're going to pay for or spend on it. So you wanna make sure that you really are in the market. It's a good question. You see a lot of this with those pieces that are kind of looking like grandmas, but are very, very common. So the Margelaine piece, it's not worth that at all. In the thousands, they don't sell for that. You can list it for anything you want. It's not until somebody stupidly pays for that that you have an actual sales record. So there you go. Okay, good question though, thanks. Um, hi, Dr. Lori. When I was growing up, my stepfather had a wall-mounted pendulum clock with Roman numerals. Okay, Roman numerals, one, two, three, you know. But the number four on the face of the clock was not IV, it was actually four ones to make the Roman numerals. My question is, does it affect the value? So, so let's, let's see, let's pick up some paper. So, so instead of it being like this, IV, like that, which is five minus one, which is four, right? Your stepfathers had this, or four ones. Okay, that's not uncommon on mid 20th century clocks with Roman numerals. So it, it helps sometimes to have a pen around. Um, my question is, how does this affect value when the clock's Roman numerals are not the correct number? So you're thinking it's only correct if it has the I and the V? Well, that's not really true because it is an accepted way to do four if you just do one, two, three, four. Typically, anything one, two, or three, or four, anything under five can be written that way in Roman numerals. Roman numerals are hard. I was never good at Roman numerals because you have to do the subtraction. I was never good at subtracting ever. I was terrible at subtraction, so anyway. But the Roman numerals make it a little harder because you have to use those particular Roman numerals. But yeah, no, it doesn't impact value of the clock. The value in the clock is all in the works. It's also in the body of the clock. So if it's like a tall case clock or a grandfather or a grandmother clock, the case has to be well made, right? Well carved, well designed, well decorated, usually in wood. The face has to be important as well as the works. The works are really the money. The works are the money in any clock. Okay, where else are we? I think I have a prototype or a salesman sample. 
How do I know? All right. I have a miniature. Okay. Anytime you have a miniature, all of you people think that, oh, it must be a salesman sample. You know, you never think that maybe, just maybe, it was made in miniature on purpose. Maybe it was made for a dollhouse. Maybe it was made for children. You know, people are surprised when I go, oh, well, that little sewing machine, that wasn't a prototype for Singer. That sewing machine was marketed to kids with their little hands. So they made the sewing machine smaller, not intimidating and easier for them to work with. Very typical. A lot of people will think it's a salesman sample, a salesman sample. And then you see, see these things and you say, oh, it's definitely a salesman sample. There are some miniature salesman samples, sure. But there are oftentimes pieces that are actually made for children. So if you have something small, make sure that you are either looking, you are trying to tell the difference. If you're trying to tell the difference between whether you have a salesman sample or not, think about what that object and how that object would have been marketed. So for example, the most common salesman samples are for stoves or appliances, right? Ice boxes and such. So you'll see those particular things as salesman samples because they're usually small met cast metal items that were brought door to door to hopefully engage Mrs. Jones into, you know, buying that particular type of stove. But small pieces can also be used for children, used for dollhouses, or just done in miniature by design. Good question. What's next? Let's see. Oh, wow, it's long. Uh, I love you and your show, Dr. Lori. You're genuine, fine, funny, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, yeah, I'm fabulous. We know. Okay. I don't know how anyone could have, have find any fault with anything you do, so don't listen to the trolls and keep doing what you're doing. You have many people who love you. I know you all love me, and I appreciate it very much, and I don't listen to the trolls, but you know, you have to give them their voice too, but you have to also take things with a grain of salt. But thank you very much for being so nice. Let's get to your question. I have a question about a print I purchased recently at a thrift store. Okay, good. I'm glad to see that you are looking at art at the thrift store. That's a good thing because there's a lot of money in it. It's a vintage signed and numbered print that looks like it was originally framed in an acid mat. 95% of the time, yes, they are framed in acid mats. You may remember me telling you that acid-free mat board and acid-free foam core really doesn't come into widespread use until about 1983. So prior to that, if it's framed earlier than uh, 1983 or so, guess what? You probably have acidic materials. That means cardboard, which is bad. That means acid mats, which are bad. That means backboards, which are bad. So you got to get rid of all of that. You want acid-free, chemically inert, cotton, museum quality materials for framing. And today you can get those. You just ask for them. Um, it was originally framed in an acid mat, but reframed professionally using acid-free materials. Well, that's good. That's good. However, I can see some browning of the print. That's called tanning. And here's the deal. When you have somebody who in fact is saying, oh, it's tanning, they're describing the piece as being tanned. Tanning is not a good word. Don't think tanning is good. Tanning is acid burning and acid burning is damage. Damage means low value, okay? Oh, it's tanning, that's crap, that's not right. So can this be reversed? Does some acid burning make the print not valuable anymore? Thanks again for all you do. Okay, that's nice. Anyway, yes, it can be reversed, but it has to be reversed with paper conservation. And paper, paper conservation could be more expensive than your print. So before you do the paper conservation, you've got to find out how valuable is my print, right? How damaged is my print? You know, how much paper conservation is this going to actually require and how much money is that going to cost, right? And then do I go forward? So you have to think about that before any conservation or any restoration or any repair, know what the piece is valued at first. And I can tell you that. Okay. What's next? Let's see. That was a good question too. Uh, da, da, da. I've reached out to a number of appraisers in my area to get a hands-on appraisal and I've re received a very chilly response from all. I think they don't like dealing with steerage passengers since we all know that they would trot right out here and do the appraisal for a customer with the right pedigree and wealth. Can you provide me with an explanation for this phenomenon and advise me on how to get an in-person appraisal done? Okay, well, let's talk about a couple parts of this question. First of all, do you need an in-person appraisal or can you send a picture to me? All right, do you really need someone to stand there by this piece? So that usually is not the case. 99 times out of 100, you can send me a photo and I can identify it for you and appraise it for you. Okay, but say you still want somebody in person, why won't they come out to folks who are not in a particular class? Let's say that. All right, so a couple of things that are happening here. Most 
people would think, or most of these appraisers who I think are unscrupulous and really shouldn't be held up as professional appraisers in my view, just my opinion, and you know I have a lot of opinions, and I have them because, you know, I earned these opinions, just like you earned your opinions. But basically, I think that these people, if you don't want to serve all of the clients, you shouldn't serve any of the clients. That's first. They want to go to the folks who, based on my the person who's asking this question, he's saying, okay, I'm not of particular wealth, all right. But a lot of those people who are saying that they're appraisers wanna only go to certain people's homes or appraise for certain people of wealth because they basically wanna scope the joint. They wanna look around and see what else you have or maybe figure, oh, I can get something and they won't care because they're wealthy or they'll pay me a lot to do the appraisal. That's a lot of it. Now, that doesn't mean every appraiser is like that. Certainly not every appraiser is like that. But you have to be careful. If somebody doesn't want to do that appraisal, you don't want them appraising it for you. If they're not going to come and serve you properly, you don't want them coming into your house. As for in-home appraisals and making sure that you have an in-person appraisal, that's not always necessary in today's age of very high quality technology, good photographs. You know, your smartphones have great picture taking capabilities. So you can take a photo, send it to me, and I will shoot straight with you. Thanks for the question. What else have we got here? Would you recommend buying artwork for investment and how would you go about it? I would definitely recommend buying artwork for investment and here's how I would go about it. Go to museums, learn about art history, Learn it from me, watch the videos, and I will teach you what's good and what's not. Not every painting is great. I worked in a lot of museums in my career as a kid all the way up. And let me tell you, you know, a lot of fine art, a lot of art in museums is not great. A lot of art in museums is wonderful, and you have to learn how to educate your eyeballs to separate the two. But it's a really good idea for you to try to learn about art in museums, and here's why. When you're not tempted to buy something because you fell in love with it, you take more time looking at it. If you go, oh, I wanna buy that, I wanna buy that, you're more focused on the exchange and the sale than you are on looking at the work of art. I don't care if it's sculpture or architectural elements or paintings, prints, whatever it might be, sculptures, I want you to think about artwork as an investment and the way to do that is to invest in it. Now, you wanna set a budget. You wanna make sure that you are looking at pieces that you think that you will enjoy, right? But don't do this crap about, oh, it speaks to me. I worked in a lot of museums. Art doesn't talk at all. It's very quiet, okay? You have to start to learn what to look for and what you can afford. Sure, if you can afford Picasso's, great, buy Picasso's. If you can afford, I don't know, um, Cecilia Bow or George O'Keefe, and you like George O'Keefe or Cecilia Bow's paintings, great, buy them. But what you really need to do is identify what is good quality, right, in the history of art, and then invest. And invest with small pieces, stick to that budget and go from there. Get originals, get originals. Make sure you're getting oil on canvas, acrylic on canvas. Make sure you're getting, of course, not the mass reproduced pieces over and over and over again. You know, pieces like the Thomas Kincaid prints, pieces like, you know, the Peter Max's prints. I mean, not the prints are bad because they can have value. Again, they can have value, but you don't want to get the thing that everybody has. You know, you remember that, that Friends episode where everybody was buying Pottery Barn, you know, and everybody had the same furniture well it's the same thing in the art world you know the Salvador dollies that everybody's got you know so you want to think about those pieces that are original so look for originality look for something you like you know if you like impressionism or if you like modernism or if you like the old style the Renaissance stuff or the colonial style stuff sure but art is a very good investment and it holds its value I always tell you Fine art, furniture, precious metals, including jewelry, are the things you should be looking for. You can get them cheaply. A lot of people don't know, and I can help you identify what's valuable. They're really what hold their value long-term. That's why all the museums are full of them. Okay, next one. I hope that answers that question. That was a good question. How did you get started as an appraiser, Dr. Lori? Oh, well... Um, I have a lot of degrees in the history of art and history and museum studies. I started as an appraiser. I was in a museum and I was working in the museum and I met someone who was taken advantage of by an appraiser. I was not an appraiser at this time. And I met a 75 year old woman who sold a $50,000 document to an appraiser who gave her $50 for it. And I thought this was terrible. And I learned that women and seniors are usually the 
people who are scammed by antique fraud. So they're usually the victims of antique scams or antique fraud. And I didn't think I could save the world, but I did think that I could share my knowledge with folks so they can understand what was valuable if they were helping mom or grandma clean out the house or if they like to go to thrift stores or flea markets and buy and sell. So it started as basically a way to raise money for good causes, for Alzheimer's research, for museums, for other charities, um, for the Boys and Girls Club of America and other people. And I wanted to, in fact, do those types of things. So um, it became sort of an aside that I would appraise pieces and all everybody who I met would go, oh, you're in museums, you know art, how much is this worth? So I started to learn that way. It was a long, long time ago. I've been an appraiser a long, long time, but that is my origin story as they call it. Thanks for the question. Uh, a lot of people don't know it. I've had the good fortune to appraise fantastic objects through that, through the time. My, all of my shows and, you know, TV and all the rest of it. Uh, great pieces that I've told you about. Okay. Um, hi, Dr. Lori. Is it okay to use silver, po uh, silver polishing cloth on silver plated flatware? Okay. Now, silver plate is different than sterling silver. Sterling silver, of course, is 925 parts per thousand pure sterling or pure silver meets the sterling sander. And what that means is it's stronger than silver plate. Silver plate is usually copper and then it's plated. Sometimes they'll put actually a glaze or a sheen over it. So you have to know whether or not there is actually that sheen over the silver plate before you polish it. If you are polishing sterling silver, you need one type of polish. If you are polishing silver plate, you need a different type. A lot of people online will go online and they'll say, oh, you can use baking soda, or you can use this, or you can use that. Be careful of what you're doing. Just be careful of what you're doing with these ideas on the internet. I remember people who, one of my clients went on the internet and he was like, oh, I know how to clean my painting. And he ruined two portrait paintings from the colonial period. They were $30,000 each. And he went on the internet and thought he was going to clean them. So if you don't know what you're doing, you know, don't try to clean it. Don't be a professional restorer unless you are. Um, this question about silver plate, make sure you look on the package that it will work for silver plate and don't be overzealous about cleaning. I always say be a little dirty. My mother hates it when I say it, but be a little dirty because the more you're scrubbing and the more you're actually polishing, the more you are actually damaging or starting to damage the actual piece. Any more pieces? Oh, I go. Uh, another one. Here we go. So if I can open this up. I was looking on your website for how to care for pearls. I have black pearls, which shouldn't make any difference, right? Black pearls or, of course, the white cultured pearls or the be beige or pink cultured pearls. Should I continue to store them on velvet in my jewelry box? Yes. Always store your pearls in separated from, of course, any other types of jewelry. Um, pearls can scratch, of course. Gold can scratch pearls. Pearls can easily become scratched. Keep pearls together, usually in a velvet box if you have one. Usually if you buy pearls, cultured pearls, Mickey Moto or others at the jewelry store, they'll give you that box or they'll sell you that box. You need that box. Make sure that you don't have it rubbing up against anything else. And black pearls, the same thing if you've got South Sea pearls or pearls from places like Tahiti, um, they're the same. You have to be careful with them as well. Don't wear them in the shower. Don't put perfume on them either. Don't spray your perfume over your pearls. Perfume goes on first and then you let that kind of sink into your skin and then put your pearls on. But yes, you should do that too. I hope you're learning stuff from the Ask Dr. Lori questions and answers. I love your questions. Thank you so much. Don't forget to share the videos. I need your help sharing. Thanks again and we'll see you next time.